This morning, we're doing the series, Ephesians. But before I go, I just want to say thank you to those that have been doing, uh, contributing to it, the COVID-19 funds. We've been able to help. And if you are able to contribute again, uh, we will really suggest, please do. Uh, you know, those funds go to really people that's in need. There are tough times. But God's still sitting on the throne. Tough time, but yes, God is alive. He is not waved by COVID or any circumstance in our lives. But this morning, we go back to the story of our Father, to the story of God, to His family, and you. You are daily on His heart. So the man who wrote this book is Paul. And uh, Paul is a man who was uh, so obsessed with the grace. The reason why he was obsessed is because he knew where he came from. He knew his past. And God had to extend his grace to Paul uh, to use him as an apostle, to use him as a, as a forefront for his messages, to use him as a forefront for his gospel. Uh, for Paul was, wow, it's, a, it's a such an amazing and it's a privilege. And for you and I, we can't the privilege, friends. Uh, for Paul, it wasn't easy. He was in a prison, as we're going to read. Uh, but being in a prison, in a prison, it didn't stop him from being a, the ambassador of this life-giving gospel. And we, you're probably sitting here this morning going through uh, stuff, struggling, if you're struggling for the sake of the gospel, yes. And sometimes there are struggles that come in our lives because God wants to be glorified through you. You're saying, mm, why all I got such a struggle? Well, I don't know how, my, how, how he can refine you for the work ahead. Joseph had a beautiful dream. 17-year-old young man. But God had to prepare him for the work that he had. Paul, on the other hand, understood the call that was at the hand, the gospel. He looked at the people. And his encounter with Jesus wasn't that pretty, like you and I walk in the church and someone lay a hand on you, yeah, no. It was an was awesome encounter. His encounter with Jesus was amazing. He was knocked off his horse while on the road to go in the persecute the, uh, the Christians. While he was running away, doing other stuff, God had his plans. And this morning we look at this beautiful mystery of this awesome gospel of ours. So if you have your Bible with me, with you, please, Ephesians 3, verse 1 to 13. We're going to read, and then we're going to pick some scriptures and do some of the exegesis. For this reason, our Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, he wasn't a prisoner of Rome, of Jews or Gentile, no, he was a prison of Christ. And on behalf of you Gentile, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was made known to me by revelation, I've written briefly, and he, what he does, he, he takes us back. In chapter 2, he, he takes us back to where he, he wants to remind you that before you came to know the Lord, friends, before we came to know the Lord, we were far, far away from him. He wants us to understand that this gospel wasn't just gospel that came. I don't know. Came with the power. But blood was shed for you because Jesus loves you. When I raise my voice, I'm not shouting to you. I'm just wanting, uh, I get passionate. So I'm not shouting, I'm not screaming to you. Yeah. Just the passion of this awesome gospel. 
how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to, to sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophet by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and the partakers of the promise in the Christ Jesus. Only God can make an everlasting peace. Only God can unite in one, two people in one. In God's kingdom, one plus one is equal to one. But here, on this kingdom, one plus one is equal to two. God takes two people and makes them one. He takes Jews and Gentiles, make them one nation, friends. And he looked them as one people. He takes a black, white, and put them in one box and says, This is my people. I know you were confused and you thought I was there. You know, I'm not a scholar, but I knocked off as well. Hey? Where was I? Seven. Of this gospel, I was, I was made a minister according to gifts, working of his power. To me, though I'm a, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what was planned to the mystery of a hidden of ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, through you, through me. How is that, eh? I like this. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have a boldness and access with the confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart. The struggles that you're going through, don't lose heart. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is, is your glory. Paul is amazing. When he writes, the grace is something that is always in his heart because he knows he's not worthy of doing what he was doing. But by the grace of God, by the call of God, friends, our salvation is the is grace of God. So he... In this passage, we see five points. First, he, he points himself, he, he indicates who he was. Then he takes us back. Then he tells us the plans of God. The plan, the mystery. This is a mystery, friends. The gospel is a mystery. And then the purpose of this beautiful mystery and then the privilege you know that suffering for Christ is a privilege Christianity has become like a shopping mall hey? we becoming a generation where Christianity is like going to the shop you pick what you want if it uh, if they don't have it, then you don't. Before you come, you make your list. You know? 
uh, this is cheap there, and the grass is cheap that place, and uh, you know, I'm not going to tithe there. Now, this gospel, it's a life giving. But just remember, it's not, was paid. Your freedom in Christ was paid at the cost of his son, Jesus Christ. So, let's carry on. In verse 1 to 3, this is what Paul says. For this reason, what Paul is doing is taking us back. Uh, look, he, he's pointing us back. He said, before we carry on, can I just remind you, in, the, in Ephesians 2 verse 12, this is what it says, remember that you were at the one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and the stranger to the covenant of the promises, having no hope and without God in this world. Remember, when you had no Jesus, you was, was no hope in your life. But your hope, you have a hope now as you trust in him, but in him, not your hope. In Ephesians 2, 13 to 16, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far, far off have been brought near but the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. For he himself is our peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down his flesh, the divine wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinance that he must create in himself one new man in the place of two. Only God can do that, friends. So making peace. And it might reconcile us both to God in one body through cross. cross. Thereby, but the killing and hostility. Only Jesus can take two people Make them one. It's like a marriage. When you get married, you meet that beautiful thing. Even that in the eyes of men, we look two people because she's black and I'm white. In God's eyes, we one piece, person. So he takes the Gentiles and the Jews, he makes them one. And what it does, he takes a focus and then said, Can I paint a little bit of picture of me? And then it goes on to saying, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ. Not a prisoner of man, prisoner of Christ, friends. Even now, as we struggle, friends, to, uh, to speak the gospel into our friends, uh, to pray to our friends, to encourage them to come to a place where they have a relationship with Jesus, even though they say, no, we don't want to. No, they, they say all those kind of ugly words. Friends, remember, it's not for your sake, it's for their sake. Paul could have gone, carried on living his own life, but yet he's under, he understood the price of accepting this gospel of Jesus. I mean, this is a life-giving gospel. In Ephesians 3, verse 5 to 6, this plan, mystery. This is a mystery. Which was not made known to sons of men in the other generation, as, as it is now has been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophet by the Spirit. By the Spirit, friends. Only the Spirit of God that can reveal that. This is mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and the partakers of the one promises in Christ Jesus through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through this awesome gospel, friends. 
And that's the reason why we stand here. That's the reason why we come Sunday after Sunday. We open our homes so that our friends can come in, so that we can build one another. And when Jesus comes, he will find us waiting for him. And in Ephesians 3, verse 7 to 9, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body and the partakers of the promise and crush, crush Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given by the working of his power. To me, though I'm very enlisted, here is a man, you know, describing, even though that, remember that he, he wasn't actually around the 12. You know that, eh? He wasn't around the 12 disciples. He was on his mission, persecuting the Christians. But God had a plan. And when he had his encounter, to the point where even the disciples... The guys that they were with Jesus, they were like, friend, this guy, he was persecuting us. And this is what makes this gospel mystery. How can you take the same man who was persecuting us to come and stand by our side together to preach the gospel? Well, only God can do that, friends. And for him is a mystery. So what was the purpose of this mystery? Verse 10 to 11, this is what it says. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, but now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we talk about the heavenly, heavenly places, talking about the angels and the uncle demon. Am I right? So how is it? How do you, how you and I, you and I, can make this manifold wisdom of God display to the world? How do we do it? Let me give you, or let's look at the picture of Mr. Job. You know Job, the guy in the Bible? He had everything. Man, he was, he, he was a living a life. What happened? One moment, family member died. Then his farm was taken. Then all the, I mean, he was basically stripped naked to nothing. The angels are going, yes. Yo, 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 yo. And the devil is going, yeah. But then in one moment, the Bible says that the job actually gets a double of what he lost. How possible? We are to dig and fire the trial, friends. At that moment, was nothing that job did nothing wrong. The devil goes to God and says, I want to test your, your, your son. Let's see how he's going he gonna to do. God gives permission to the devil to try and attack Job down. Did he do that? No, he took the stuff around him. But he didn't take his God. He didn't take his faith. He didn't, I know, the Bible to a point where the God actually gives him double. At that moment, who was glorified? Was God glorified or Job was glorified? It is a painful moment. 
You and I, we might be going through struggles at the moment, friends. Lift your eyes. Cry out to God, Father, won't you come? Struggles are real. But there is a promise in the Bible that he will always be there to the very end of the age. So we are to glorify. At that moment, the angels are going, man, I can stand with this guy. And the devil is going, yo, what did just happen there? I thought I had this man on my, in my corner. I thought I had this guy. No, get, God gets the victory. God gets the glory when we dignify the, his, uh, the trials. When you and I, when the church live out the life that God has placed us into this world, looking at Jesus, that who died for us, and when we look at him, it's our source, it's our life. When our lives are Christ-centered, friends, we display this awesomeness. I know you can't arrive. Isn't that what happened to you? Some of us, our lives, can I just be blunt to say, they don't glorify God. Because you're only Christian on Sunday. You can't even say to your friend or someone close to you, buddy, let's go to church on Sunday. Oh man, can I tell you about this awesome God, God of ours? They will go like, man, what is it? Why? Which God are you talking about? You, like this, me going to church with you. No, we are to dignify the trials. We are to glorify God with our bodies. Psalm 19, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The, the scars displays his craftsmanship. The heavens. Everything God has done, has done his ultimate purpose of giving him his glory. Everything. We are made to glorify him. Keep sliding. Ephesians twelve verse thirteen. In whom in him who we have a boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask not to lose heart over what I am suffering. So guys, while Paul was in prison. The church in Ephesus, they look at them, they go, oh man, we feel sorry for this man. Suddenly they're losing heart because Paul is in prison. And here he's saying, please don't. My suffering is for your glory. Your suffering is a glory for our friends. Our struggles to bring the gospel into this dying world. The glory to others. The Luke twelve verse forty eight is what it says. But someone has done a none, not known, not now. I beg pardon. Luke twelve. But someone who has not known and then does something wrong, he will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. God has trusted us with this awesome gospel. And this gospel, friends, with you or without you, is going to reach the end of the earth. We are called to go. We are called to tell, and we are called to be the ambassadors of this awesome gospel. There will be a price, yes, there will be a price, but is a price worth it? Can I pray with us? Father, thank you. Lord, we look at the life of Paul. 
man that you called, Father, a simple man, but understood the grace. And here we are, Father. We want to understand the grace that Paul talks about. Father, give us that boldness like Paul did. Give us that boldness, Father, to be able not to shy away from this awesome gospel of yours, Father. Let us be the ambassadors of this awesome gospel that you call us to be in this dying world, especially now, Father. Let your church arise, Lord, in this city, in this nation, Lord, and beyond. We are called to go, yes, Lord. We are called to tell, yes, Father. We are called to live out this gospel and the implication we know, Father, that is tough. But in you, it's worth it, Father. Thank you, Jesus, that you've called us, you've set us apart. As a church, as a believers, Father, I pray that you come in the mighty way of our lives. Holy Spirit, come and equip us. Help us not to be quiet, not to be silent, not even to be waved by the circumstances of this world, Father. May your name be exalted. May your name be lifted high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go out there. We are called to go. We are called to tell. And friends, the implications are huge. But I tell you, our inheritance is not here on earth. Our reward is in heaven. This city is our inheritance. But our reward is in heaven. So let's go out there and let's get them. In Jesus' name. Amen.